Hey guys, today I have a real treat. I'm uh, meeting up with uh, my friend uh, Justin Barber from the Better Biomed channel. He happens to be here in Detroit to uh, be presenting at uh, Schoolcraft College for a series of uh, basically a group of biomeds. And uh, Justin's a biomed just like me, except he has spent his uh, career working on equipment and also building a really awesome uh, YouTube uh, following. So uh, Justin is a, he's been an uh, inspiration and uh, as far as just kind of showing what it looks like to release steady content and he's always putting a thoughtful uh, material out there. And so what I'm doing is right now I'm driving to pick him up and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to do some, a uh, little bit of interviewing today and we'll have a chance to talk and catch up. And I don't know what we're going to uh, exactly cover, but I promise uh, with him and I in the same location, uh, we'll probably find some pretty good stuff to talk about. So uh, with that, uh, enjoy. So hey guys, here's Justin. He's actually doing his YouTube. Check that out. There he is. It's Jason Klutz. Uh. <laughs> Five minutes later. We're uh, on the way to go repair a piece of equipment. And Justin uh, Barber from the Better Biomed channel is uh, here. We were just talking about uh, how we do what we do and the repairs. And uh, we were discussing just some of those fundamental truths of things that are always just always true with repair and we um, just to mention the rules of repair and so I figure this would be a good opportunity to kind of like have a discussion about some of those things that are uh, that are universally true when you're approaching broken equipment or maintenance and uh, and Justin I'll just let you know the preview only shows me, but okay. you are on it. I no, promise, because okay. it's a fish fish eye. So you don't have to like ah. <laughs> no, so right. sorry, I didn't you want you to be like looking it. over the are, whole time. Are you uncomfortable with me coming over here towards your lap? I mean, is that uh, no? I, I see your little caveat there. I, I, I can't turn it, so I, I already make you uncomfortable. I oh no, we're good. Here, put my arm oh, around that's, that. That's cool. Um, but so so this just seemed good because. Uh, I was just sharing with uh, Justin that you know that I've got a few things that I always do when I'm approaching dental equipment and since we have two different channels uh, maybe this would be a good opportunity for Justin to fuse some of his knowledge over on my side and uh, those of you technicians or doctors who are trying to solve problems would have uh, these these things in your tool build as well so uh, can you tell me a little bit about the uh, rules of repair what's okay. the uh, origin of that so um Every single skilled trade has knowledge that's passed down throughout the years, and, and a lot of that is timeless. And the thing is, is if we don't hand down the knowledge, then your skilled trade no longer exists. I mean, look at wow. masonry and some, and some other things. Okay. So uh, some of the things that I've been taught that I teach on my channel, um, the people that taught me those are no longer here. Okay. They're, they passed off. You know, they're, they're gone. Yeah. And okay. with, just by knowing that, you can see that if we don't share some of these tidbits, you know, that's the whole reason we do YouTube, right? Yes. Is, is because every day you see something that you wish you knew in the past. So I, now you, you can show somebody the shortcut to that knowledge that you, you had to learn the hard way. Absolutely. And I, I think there's different generations of technicians. And I feel like there's an old school that maybe felt like, hey, if I, I need to keep a few things to myself, because if I let other people know these skills, I'm going to become less relevant, or somebody oh, yeah. else is That's going to true. have an edge on me. And uh, you know, and then there's also kind of a new school, which I'm, I believe we're both a part of, just because we're like self-selecting to be YouTube uh, trainers. That that you know, I view the industry as that you know, technicians that are coming along, like anybody that be watching, is really has a capacity to stand on our shoulders. And I really think that's what we owe to the industry because it's given us so many opportunities and our, like we get to do what we love every day. Absolutely. The, the least we could do is help somebody else have a foundation to love it as well. So that it's that accumulative. And you and I, I think we've learned that there's no amount of information we could give away that isn't going to be like replenished by something new. That's right. And the process of training actually uncovers a whole new set of questions that we have to answer. So, so really, it's not like 
uh, it's we're more like a river where information is passing through as opposed to like some sort of like a you know like a a, a boat or something right. where we're just trying to use all this information to like protect our castle or whatever right. we're it's not we're, like a bucket of water and as when you empty it all out that's it you're yeah done. yeah you're totally. irrelevant no Absolutely. It's, they're, the bucket's always getting replenished totally and, and you know one of the things that i learned back in the military is that the best way to learn something is to teach it yes right? I mean, not only what because... What was it, like, what was it, see one, do one, teach one? Yes, yeah. yeah. Like, teach one I is, like, the that, third step, right? I haven't heard that in years. <laughs> yes, yes, that is... I And I live by that yep. to this very day. So, I, I create these uh, rules, things that I teach people every single day. Whenever I get a new biomed, um, I, I teach them these, these truths. Because if you follow the simple 10 to 12 rules... You will always be more successful than your peers, and plus, I mean, if you think about it, the, the hassle, if, the, when you mess up, your customer is upset, your career is more complex, your image is damaged. Yes. If, if you just follow these simple rules, your life is going to be so much easier. Okay, okay. Right? So, the 10 rules. We're going to start off with rule number one. All right. And normally, you start at the, at the very bottom and you work your way up. We're gonna start at rule number one, and that's Ooh. because this is the one rule that can get you killed. Okay. So rule number one is never ever trust somebody else's troubleshooting. Ever. Start okay. at start at ground zero every single time. And that means not only uh, when somebody says like I changed out this board or I tried that or this, always start at the most basic simple things. Is it plugged in? You know, did you hit the correct switches? And you will be surprised at the amount of times that the other person just missed a step. Wow. Or, or they messed okay. up. Or... I've been there. If, if you want to take it even a step further, if they say they locked out a circuit breaker, mm. and, and they say, no, oh, it's safe, I, I did it. No. Physically go and see the circuit breaker yourself, verify yeah. that it's safely locked out, and then pull out your meter and verify it's de-energized. Absolutely. What if, what if he de-energized one for the next room? Well, I actually, mean, you know, one of the things you guys saw when you guys watch my videos is there's this one scene in my intro where I'm like doing something in this panel. I think it's low voltage and it was actually 220. Ooh. And that's that big flash and spark. I'll put it right here. Um, that was because I did not follow this rule. And, you, and Justin, you're right. You could definitely hurt yourself or others. And I would say a really good way to enact that rule is when you're working on equipment, you know, always make sure that you can see the end of the power cord there you go. for an electrified piece of equipment. You know, make sure that it's it's not like in a bundle or going behind a, you know, uh, there was there was this one story that I heard from somebody that I respect, and he told me that he was one time working on a piece of equipment and the. Uh, he was trusted somebody else like I plugged it or he unplugged it but the thing was he never moved the cord from behind the device but it was still actually plugged in and he was decommissioning a piece of equipment and he took his Leatherman and he cut the and, he, and his, his story went and when I woke up <laughs> so that one sticks with me so definitely that's a really great rule Justin I mean it, it, this applies to every technical career field you could be a plumber and if, if the other plumber said they tried this, this, and this, yep. always start at square one and, and yeah. start from the, the basics. Make sure that it's safe for you, not for anybody else, for okay. you, all right? And you might even find the problem while you're at it, right? You almost always do. That's just it. Is most people <laughs> are chasing their tails. There's this there's this personal habit that I, I call like cumulative stupidity. And that's, I've done ORs for 19 years, and what people will do is one person will go over, they'll try something, and then the next person will come over and try the exact same thing. And wouldn't you know it, they get the exact same results, right? Wow, okay. So, and, and the thing is, is none of them thought outside the box. None of them thought, hey, maybe it's not plugged in or maybe I have the wrong consumables or something. So always start at square one. Okay. And never ever trust somebody else's troubleshooting. So that's rule number one. Okay, I like it. Rule number two, Band-Aid fixes always come back. So band-aid fixes are, are more than what you think they are, but a band-aid fix is basically when you do something just to get something up and running, but band-aid fixes can also be just going up and tightening down a screw that came loose. 
the reason that's a band-aid fix is why did it come loose in the first place? Uh, is it because the threads are stripped out? Is it because it's a high vibration environment? Why did the fastener come loose? Okay. And a band-aid fix is also electrical tape. I hate electrical tape. Uh, and nobody on my team will ever use electrical tape. That's a promise. And the thing is, is if I see that stuff, that's a band-aid fix. It's not a permanent fix. Electrical tape comes off, it's not sanitary. I mean, it plus what's hidden underneath it. You never know. And you know, I'll, I, I agree with you. You're gonna be a little disappointed with me though, because I do carry electrical tape in my box. But you and the reason, uh, uh, yeah, the reason, the reason for that is, is that sometimes a uh, temporary fix is what's uh, is is. Uh, Sometimes a temporary fix is what the client is capable of doing themselves. And so I believe that temporary fixes are irrelevant because uh, in dentistry, there's a certain number of operatories and there's certain right. equipment. Understood. And so to have the capacity to know how to do a temporary fix can be the difference between having an operatory up or down. But your key word there is temporary. Temporary. That means it always comes back. It, and you're right. It's so that's gonna true. Fail. It's always going to fail again. That's true. I mean, definitely temporary fixes, you're, you're right. And I think as long as, I think as long as you're truthful with the client of what's happening, because sometimes true. you're like, hey doc, I, I've got to, I've got to get out of here. I don't have a ton of time. This is what the problem is, but we're temporarily going to, you know, we're going to do this to get you by. Right. And I'll say most of the time they're, they're fine with it. And so. as long as you're being truthful. Now, I think passing off a temporary fix as a permanent fix is definitely a problem. And you're right. It will erode your credibility. That's Actually, what most people try to do. With the staff and then also with other techs. Because, if you know, we come after one another and we find that there's, you come after my <laughs> unit and I left a little electrical tape in there, you're going to respect me a little bit less. So that that's true. Absolutely. But, I mean, the key word there is temporary. There's always temporary fixes. Okay. And that's why the, the rule wasn't never do temporary fixes. Okay. No, it's band-aid fixes always come back. Okay. In other words, it's, it's not a permanent solution, and you should never treat it that way. And, unfortunately, most people do treat it that way. Maybe that, yeah, they, yeah, I think follow-up is a little challenging, right? Because coming back to something requires, you know, that you put that placeholder in your mind and you're like hey we need to resolve this and when it's when you put it far away it's sometimes it's hard to do that so I That's think you're, you're that, that makes a lot of sense buddy so rule number three this this is a pretty big one um, if it happens to one it happens to more so the, the thing is is let's say in the previous example I talked about a, uh, a screw coming loose well if a screw comes loose on one device, maybe you should check other ones in your fleet because they're probably also happening on that one. Huh. And, and this, we see this all the time with like casters coming loose. Um, we see it if there's user abuse, like if they're slamming a door into yeah. something or if they're installing consumables wrong, yeah. check it. Because if it's happening to one, they're probably doing it to other ones as well. So even though you fix the problem with one, if the other rooms have the same problem, you're just going to get called back out and your customer's probably going to be more upset. But if you if you notice that you have a problem and you just do a courtesy check with the other ones, yes. now you just became the hero. Especially if you're there for, for right. a full hour yeah, right or there, your right? time. Yeah, exactly. Now, I would say, um, you know, the thing that I'm reminded of that really does not exist in dentistry is uh, FDA recalls, right? ECRI alerts. Because like in, in the hospital setting, for those of you who work mainly dental, in the hospital setting, there's there's lists that come out every every week, every day, really. And there are these alerts from the government and they say, hey, there's a known issue. So it's like kind of instead of at Costco where there's like the baby stroller that is gonna like chop your kid's hands off. It, this one is with medical devices. And so it tells biomeds what things to look at. Uh, now, one way that we address this actually in our, uh, like I, we have a preventive maintenance plan for my clients where we go in every month. And so what I do is uh, some offices have a whiteboard where you write problems on the whiteboard. They write the, the client writes the problems. We come in and we solve the problems and then erase the whiteboard That's cool. and we yeah. solve the issue. Well, it's not really. And the reason is, is because you don't have any sort of a history of what the problems are. Oh, I got it. So a whiteboard model is effective because you can just write it on the wall and then a technician can fix it. 
but what we do is we actually do a binder based model and so the binder based model we actually have a page where you write the problem you write the date and the initials oh, I got and then when we come in we actually solve the problem and then we write the solution the date and our initials okay and so what we end up having is now a record of all the repairs that have happened and so more than just troubleshooting problems we can actually tailor training and prevention because for me it's not just solving the issues but it's actually preventing them and that's where if we can teach a client because a private sector repairs cost money yeah and uh in a dental or in a uh, hospital you guys right you're on staff and it's you know money doesn't really matter it's it's not as front of mind as right. say like in a private dental office where every single time the doctor calls you out they are paying you and uh, so that is uh, yeah that's a really good good one there so rule number four and and this this goes for a continuity and longevity of any maintenance program it was already broke time permitting every repair should be treated as an experimental opportunity to investigate the malfunction and figure out why it happened in the first place Ooh. you're it's an opportunity instead of every time something breaks you see it as a problem you should see it as an opportunity it's an opportunity to improve your skill set and maybe prevent failure in other devices this you're gonna notice a lot of these rules are gonna intermingle and this one intermingles with the last one that was if it happens to one it happens to more if you solve the problem you should check the other devices but you have to know why the problem happened in the first place so if you have the time you should experiment and see why it really happened you know you, you know what you sound like right now you sound like a business owner <laughs> and because uh, that is business right and in my particular business one of the foundations have been through exploration and through learning because being a student of malfunctions tells me like what types of things I can do to actually like, you know, uh, provide services and thereby generate revenue into my business right. through problems. And that's really where, again, preventive maintenance uh, has become the thing because doctors would call us out. Like if you think about dentistry, this is one of the things that like doctors, they only call that like, they schedule six month checkups with the dental patient because they don't tell patients like, hey, when you're in a lot of pain, come in. They want to catch problems when they're small and become right. in before they got painful. That's true. So uh, having that sort of a model where you are, really are uh, a student of problems and you are learning from them, uh, I believe that's something that's also going to cause you to like step up as a technician because you're always learning. Even if no other people are teaching you, that's the true. problems are teaching you. That's right. You know? It's an opportunity. Exactly. Like yeah. I like that word, opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a very positive opportunity uh, for you if you understood the problem. Yep. You could solve this problem with your other clients. I mean, as a business owner, if, yep. you, if you see that it's a water quality issue and you have a certain O-ring or something or you're seeing that there, there's premature wear and tear on the device, yeah. you can use that knowledge for other people's sake. You know, so while yeah. it's costing this person money, if you spent a little more time investigating why it happened in the first place, yep. you could solve that problem for the entire industry, yeah. which is amazing. So that, that was rule number four. Okay, awesome. Rule number five, if you touch it, you own it. Ooh. Yeah, so this one is multifaceted. Wow. So every mishap involving that device thereafter can and will be blamed on the technician, even if it's completely irrelevant to what you are doing. Wow. So if you go in and you go in to adjust a leveling foot on something, and now all of a sudden the power switch stops working, they're gonna blame it on you, even though you had nothing to do with it. Yeah. So that's one facet of this. The other facet is if, if you touch it, you own it, is what we call in the military mission creep. So, you know, biomed and IT, there's this, this thing, this fight that's going on, like whose responsibility is this or that? Okay, so, and, by, and just to put a little context here, what you're talking about is the difference between as, as equipment becomes more computerized, mm -hmm. it plugs into more that's like right. information systems. And so now there becomes a little bit of a conflict on does the computer right. guy own it or does the biomed own it? And so this is something that I'm very familiar with. Re viewers might not, but, but basically you're 
you know, you're making a good point there. So go on. So yeah. And as a business owner, this this could go against you because what if you're not insured to handle a certain type of thing? Like let's say you do a construction project for a customer, but you're not a general contractor. Yeah. So I mean, there's many ways of thinking about this, yeah. but you, there, the rule is, if you touch it, you own it. So you could also creep into doing something that you're not supposed to be doing because maybe your budget isn't there for you to be doing IT's job. I'll, I've got two so, stories on that. One of the yeah. stories on that was um, a client once asked me to hang a chalkboard in their lobby for kids and this building had steel studs and I okay. was not prepared for that. <laughs> um, and so I totally didn't know what I was doing at that point in my business for mounting things. And I totally messed up her walls and it actually cost me work with her for uh, for about two years and we're back there now but that was one example where I did something that I wasn't thinking oh, okay and so there's a term that I've learned to explain these things because sometimes clients will pressure you I've learned the term husband grade I'm husband grade on a lot of things and so what I tell them because sometimes you know okay. people want you to do stuff and I'm in a business to be helpful but it, what I say is like look I'm you know I'll try to help you but here's the thing I'm not a, you know, this is not what I do. And, uh, you know, I, and I'm husband grade. And in other words, I do this in my house, but, and so what I found is the way people respond to that, if they're, if they're non-verbals and everything, like they tell you, but it's okay. Other, and the second thing I'll say to that is by keeping a good network of other there trades. And what I found is when people come to me with things that are improvement related, there's a local business called the Handyman Connection. And it, the name's a little bit unfortunate, but what they are is it's basically a franchise with about 35 technicians. And so they've got all, they got plumbing, electrical, carpentry, yep. drywall, like all those sorts of things. And so what I do is basically, if I get asked to do something that's outside of my wheelhouse, what I do is I make a solid connection referral at that point, and I basically refer it straight to a trusted partner. And that way I'm still helping them, right. but I'm not at the, I, I didn't touch it, so I don't own it. That's right. And their degree of likelihood they're gonna be happy is way higher, right. and I still was a hero for them, and I didn't have to do something that's outside my wheelhouse. That's very true, you still, they just want it solved. Right, they, they don't yeah, care who does totally. it. They just want help, yeah. They, they just want to solve. Yeah, but anyhow, that's a good one. If you touch it, you own it. Definitely um, know your limits, and for me, uh, know what you're insured on. A good example right. is water systems. Oh, yeah. I've learned that there are things that I touch with water, but I always, I always put the wrench on it twice, and I always double check all my wrench connections. Uh, double checking things, I think, does fall under that you know, but I'm sure you're probably gonna gonna get there. Um, so rule number six, <laughs> if you don't know the answer, consult another source of information. This goes exactly with what he just said. And like I said, you're gonna see a lot of these rules, they co-mingle because it's, it's more like a, a way of life. Uh, while I did separate them into individual rules, you're gonna find out that these ethics just all fit together and having a network of people that you can rely on. If you don't know the answer, yeah. find somebody that does. True, and you know, what I found is actually having a solid network is actually, you know, the, the it's one thing to have the network and to like get information from those people, but, it, but the other thing that you can get from them is actual work. Okay. So what I found is taking that same network that you have, developing it, and then as opportunities come, what you do is you make solid referrals to the types of things that people want. You know, that's always in my conversations with somebody is like, hey, what type of work can I be sending your way? And so that way I'm sending the chalkboard mounting to people that want it. Okay. And in turn, they might have a dental office that needs some work and then they're gonna send that work my way. So a nice. referral is a gift. And that is really something that you can realize, you know, as you're, you know, find people that want referrals, give them there, and then your network's gonna get stronger because that person, when you call, they're gonna, um, they're gonna actually want to pick up from you because it could be a referral. I, I agree. I would completely agree. So that was rule number six. Rule number seven, and, and this is as a business owner, this is your most important one. Image is everything. Your reputation is only as good as your last repair. Now, you really have to think about that because if you do 100 repairs and you are awesome at every single one of them, but you did one repair that you did a half-assed job, okay, they're gonna remember that one repair. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And, and that's how this works is 
in any repair career field, all you have to prove that you're good at what you do is your image. And your image can also go with the referrals that we just talked about. You see yes. how these all intermingle? People talk, and when they, they know that you're reliable, you are gonna be the person that they talk about. But also, yeah. if you are unreliable, you are gonna be the one that they talk about. Like, don't use him or something. Well, you know, what I'm gonna, what, one thing I'm gonna uh, kind of, you know, mention there is part of that image, uh, you know, and quality is cleanliness of equipment. Okay. And I know, like, one thing I remember from working on hospital equipment, and fortunately it doesn't exist in dental offices, is surgical tape. Oh, and yeah. all that surgical <laughs> tape residue all over everything. Yeah. And I remember how much time I freaking spent trying to, like, clean off all the residue, like, like residue, like that uh, the sticky remover, yeah. uh, you know, goo gone. You know, uh, all that Mr. Clean Magic Research, well, all that kind of stuff. Since you did that stuff, luckily Joint Commission has helped out with that and they've made that a hot topic. Okay. Ad adhesives on medical equipment. You'll okay. Get written up for it in a heartbeat. Woo! That, okay. Fact, it's, it's such an easy, low hanging fruit. Yep. That's what they go for. Wow. Um, so it helped the whole industry by them doing that though. Wow. Because you're That's absolutely good. right. Because it was, it was a problem. It was a real problem. They call it eye tape, that clear type of tape that they put on everything. Yeah. So, yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was a real problem. And, but again, that's why, you know, we work as a team, mm -hmm. including your inspection activities, yep. you know, to, to help solve the industry-wide problems. But yeah, so uh, your image is everything. What I will put onto that is when we do repairs, sometimes cleaning the equipment is the one thing you can do that the client actually recognizes. I Think about say. this. You could do the most complicated repair on something like a sterilizer, an autoclave. We do a lot of those. Well, if you give it back to them filthy on the outside, you could have done everything right on the inside, and all they're going to realize is that it's still dirty coming back. Conversely, you could have done next to nothing on the inside, but if the thing comes back spotless and clean, that client is going to have such a good, it's, I call it a gold star spot. And you know, it's one of my little things, but basically cleaning the equipment is one of the important yeah. steps of maintenance. You know, it, we just came from a call where the customer's original complaint was that an overhead light was not functioning correctly, which it could have been a user error type of situation. Could have been. But the fact of the matter is, is in the end, you gave them more substance. You went and said, hey, what other stuff can I do for you while we're here? Oh yeah. And in doing so, you became the hero on what would have been maybe an annoying call for them because all they see is like minuses, right? Because oh, they, yeah. they see just bills and what I get out of it. Yep. So clean the equipment, even if you did nothing to the equipment, but you cleaned it, yep. it could have been a user error, but you cleaned the equipment. Now they still feel good about it. Absolutely. And that's such yeah, a good one. And it's so, it's so, uh, such an easy thing. So we're gonna do rule number eight. Okay, eight, here we go. Rule number eight, if you don't have enough time to do it right the first time, you'll have plenty of time to do it right the second time. <laughs> and that one, that's one of those old adages that, that has gone down from generation to generation. And it's absolutely true. Okay. Because, I mean, if you don't do a good enough job, you're gonna have to come back. And it, not even necessarily a Band-Aid fix, because a Band-Aid fix is still a fix, right? It, yeah. It's not a permanent fix, but this one here, it's just saying if, if you don't do it right the first time, you're going to have plenty of time to do it right the second time. There's no such thing as I don't have enough time to do it right. Because you're always going to have time or it's going to be made for you. Yeah. And the worst part is, is when you have to come back because it's still broke, your customer is going to be upset. It's yeah. going to be a more intense situation. Everybody's going to be looking at you thinking you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So it's always best to make sure you do it right the first time and make sure you do your checks before you leave. I mean, check yeah. everything out before you leave. Well, yeah, and I feel like there's definitely one of the things that we've been doing and I've been trying to initiate uh, is, you know, trying to increase quality because I believe what you're talking about is really a quality issue. Mm -hmm. And if you have a problem with quality in your organization or the work you do, right, it's going to result in warranty work. Because in my industry, that's what it's called. A warranty work is when you're doing a job right. the second time for no money. So, like, you're basically, like, you're, you're not making the money you should be making because you're not on the job you should be. You're actually back like trying to like earn the money that you already earned yesterday. 
which for my for a business is totally not good. Now, uh, what I've been instituting with my guys is what I'm, I kind of like made a term called quality partnership. Okay. And what that is, is in the training atmosphere, what I'm doing is having the one guy who did the job find somebody on the team to basically explain the repair that he did, how he did, okay, point at things, show them, and so it's a partnership. So this quality partnership is gonna result in the one who did the job teaching, either he's teaching his boss or the one that knows more so that he can demonstrate competency, um, or he's teaching somebody who doesn't know as much and in that sense, he's lifting them up. But either way, he's saying exactly everything he did. And then as huh. far as um, what I always do when I'm done with a job, is I look with my eyes, I touch with my hands when it's safe, and I do what's called uh, wiggle checks, and um, basically like, you know, like on a connector, on a dental unit, I pull at about probably 20% to one third power to try to like see if it'll come off because, right. you know, so things like that, so doing those quality checks at the end prevent you from, because I don't think that people really want to do a crappy job, it's just they don't do the right quality checks at the end, I, and so bad work is going to manifest yes. through a series of checks that you do. Because if you pull on something and it comes off, you're not going to leave it like that. But Part if you never you pull, you're never going to know. So that's, that's yeah, that, that's definitely an interesting one. That, that one was handed down to me uh, I like that. throughout the years. Um, and again, you're going to notice that there's a trend between all of these rules. And that trend is that they're all related. Okay. Yep. And and rule number nine is is no exception. <laughs> rule number nine is eliminate the predictable failures because the unpredictable is still going to happen. Now this one here, I, I came up with this rule because everybody was running around at the last minute right before an inspection, and I was sitting back and I was like, wait a minute, why are we running around acting like we didn't know what we were supposed to be doing this whole time? when we could have just been doing the right thing the whole time. So there's certain predictable things, like in the biomed world, we have different colored PM stickers for every year. So you know units that haven't been seen this year because they got a different color sticker on them. Yep. Well, joint commission and inspection activities, they know that rule too. Yeah. So that's called the low hanging fruit. Yeah. Eliminate the low hanging fruit because the stuff that you didn't think about is still gonna happen. You know, you're still gonna have like the item that tips over accidentally, or you're still gonna have the item that catches fire unexpectedly. Yep. So we always try to eliminate the stuff that we can predict. Like I can predict that you're gonna have a power cord failure based on how the staff is wrapping in around the device. I can predict that some of your casters are gonna fail because a couple of them already failed. I mean, there's certain items that fail at about the same rate. There's a certain life expectancy. Yeah. So we eliminate the predictable because the unpredictable is still going to happen. Uh, that's a really great... Uh, it's almost like you're... You, the, and the reason you can predict it is because you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where having a documentation and actually like uh, having moments to share information that's amongst a team is, you know, hey guys, you know, let's go ahead and take a look at look for this or whatnot and even in that preventive maintenance binder where uh, that I've got on my business where you know we're writing the problems so that the client has a history those are important because now that starts to create a precedent and uh, you need a precedent in order to plan right because if, if, if it's just a new day every day and you're never learning then you're just going to do every day yeah you're just going to be chasing your tail but because like you said if you're a student of the problem if you're a student of the craft you're gonna you know and this is where i feel like you know i always used to view repairs as science right but recently i've begun to view our industry as an art as well it is and i feel like with art you pay attention to the small things with art, you move the position of your body to be able to more fully appreciate a picture or to look through a camera. And I feel like with equipment, you know, to, to kind of like look at different things through different lenses, again, you're seeing and you're gonna be able to predict things because you're now more knowledgeable. So that's, you know, eliminating the, like the predictable, wow, you know, like that's like 80% of the battle right there. So what, what you're actually doing, and, and so, 
I, we talked about this a little bit earlier, not on camera, but what it is is you're turning your your maintenance program from a reactive program where you are chasing your tail, you're always trying to solve, solve problems and put out fires to a proactive program. Yeah. And that is where you're actually doing sweeps. You're doing sweeps, like going yeah. to your customers periodically yeah. and establishing those relationships and figuring out their culture and, yeah. and how they manage their equipment and you figuring out their shortcomings to create a better environment for the, for the patient. I right. mean, and, and this is for all repaired career fields. It's not just for patient based, but it's it's one of those things where you are, that's our goal, right? Is to, to make your customer happy and yep. create a better environment for them. Well, and for, for along that same lines, one of the things that we do with, uh, with a monthly preventive maintenance plan that we do is I use a preventive maintenance plan as a training uh, scenario for my junior technicians. Because if I send them in there when everything's perfect, and my goal with my clients is perfection, which is not common with dental repair. Uh, but if you're in an office every month, you have the luxury of aiming for perfection. When my guys see something that's properly working month after month, and they get used to it, as soon as it begins to malfunction, they're gonna know right away, hey, this compressor is you know, taking 30 seconds longer than it used to, what's up? And that's where I think, like you're saying, is having uh, you know, kind of those predictable things we're just checking in with those and solving them at that level. That's incredible. That's really, that's really a good uh, point. Well, now you're seeing the relationship to the other rules. Because also, if it happens to one, it happens to more. So True. if you have a fleet of 100 of these out in the field, you see a problem with one of them. Now you take that knowledge, that tidbit, and now you share it amongst the rest of your customer base and everybody's life gets better. The yeah. costs go down, your profitability is gonna go up because your image is everything goes up. Yep. I mean, so one of the things I do to my junior technicians is uh, not necessarily even junior technicians. When I have technicians assigned to my team, uh, I assign them certain departments or certain customers. I will go to that customer and I will ask them, who's your biomed? And I do that because they should know your name. They should know your face. Yep. And that's just it. If they don't know the name, then I know that that technician is not doing the rounding correctly. Right. And, and the whole thing behind this is you eliminate the predictable. You create periodic sweeps. You round with your customers. And if you're not rounding with your customers, you're ignoring rule number nine. So, no, no, that's okay. So now for you and I, that's probably pretty good because, you know, again, we like people. But what happens if you have like an introverted staff member who maybe, because I believe part of what we do, what I've come to know is with Biomed and even my business with dental repair, uh, like you've been hearing it a little bit today already, the salesmanship is important. Yeah. And I believe, you know, part of, you know, you've got to sell your value to the client uh, by letting them know what you can do. And I'll say not everybody's a salesman. Like, but does, does that mean if they're not a salesman that or they're not personality? That's then the next rule. Does that mean they're not going to be a good tech? Or yes. what does that mean? Yes. Actually, yes. Oh, that's, oh. that's the next rule. <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that is rule number 10. Sorry, you're doomed. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're doomed. If, if I, I myself am an introvert. And okay. um, I myself, I would love to go back to my hotel room and every one of these events, I get wore out. I go back to my hotel room, I just wanna turn on Netflix, I just want to just take it easy. It's not a luxury that I have, because okay. what problem does that solve? Nothing, right? right? So introversion is not a luxury that we have. Okay. And, and rule number 10, that's why. And we just seen this with the last call. Rule number 10, sometimes the only thing broke is the user. Try to fix the user to prevent future damage to the equipment. We fix people too. Now, I tell people this all the time. We fix people too. We don't just fix equipment. We fix people too. Okay. So part of your job is the user. It is the people. Yeah. Because if the user is doing something unsafe, it's your job. It's your responsibility right. to, to make that known, which we just see in the last case. Do you, do you know the flashpoint of those materials? Or do you know the toxicity of the fumes? We don't know that. Yeah. But it's definitely not good, right? No. So you have to solve this problem by offering staff training. Yep. A big a big part of what any career field, any technical career field is staff training. So yeah. if you interface with customers, it's your responsibility to make sure
sure that they're doing the right thing. So we fix people too. So one of the things that we do is offer training okay. to our users. And that means that you are going to have to involve yourself and establish a relationship with your customer. You have to. And if you don't, you are a half-assed technician. Whatever it is. You could be even an <laughs> auto tech. And if you want no relationship with your customer whatsoever, then you're you're not as good as the next guy who wins. Yeah. And that's that's all there's to it. Yeah. I mean, you could still be a, an excellent clutch technician, but if you only have that one piece of skill that you can do, you're limited career-wise compared to your competition. Yeah, I would definitely say yeah. And if somebody's job or somebody's goal is only just to go in and be a clock puncher, you know, I think we need. We need clock punchers, right? Like, not everybody can be like depot the lead salesman. Yeah, there's yeah. always there's always a, 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 a world of depot technicians. Yeah, which even even dealerships for like auto repair, they have the guys that don't interface with the customers at yeah. all. But I think you know if if somebody has actually been with us for this roughly 45 minutes up to this point, I think they probably are in the self-selecting group, like you probably are trying to become better. You're right. probably trying to figure out like, what's the edge? How am I gonna take my career to the next level? And you know, what Justin and I are really getting at is that, you know, I think the equipment is only one side of the job. That's right. But if you can, if you can properly, um, you know, if you can properly like influence people, uh, if you can, uh, you know, do things like, I mean, I've always had this, phrase where it's like, you know, hey, success equals, you know, uh, uh, preparation plus opportunity. And I feel like, you know, in this, you're, you're by coaching clients, by looking for the things, by preparing yourself to be aware of the world that's around you and catch things, you know, and fix things, you're going to be successful because all the while, like, you know, you never look at anything that happens with your repair life is a waste because you're always learning something there's always if, opportunity if you did something that took longer and maybe you 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 realize you know what i uh you know man i messed up because this took me longer than it should have what you're going to do is next time you're going to be quicker that's right and where this demonstrates itself in my life rule number four is i have <laughs> i have people and this just happened two visits ago, because uh, just Justin and I've been riding around. Um, what happens is people say, "Oh, that's all it took," and and I kind of stop them, and I'm like, "Wait a second, you know, like I know I made it look easy, but that doesn't mean that that the service that I just provided is cheap." And that's where I think that communication and helping your clients properly value what you right. do. But you know, those are all really good, man. I like this a lot. I have one last one, and it's. It's maybe the most important out of all of them. It's because it's two ones, or because it's eleven. Are we turning it to eleven? It is. It is. <laughs> we, we are going to eleven on this. One. And you know, over time, as I learn more things, because I'm I'm still a student. You're still a student. Heck yeah. We I learn new stuff every single day. I learn stuff from people every single day. More importantly. Yep. And so I'm at rule number eleven. And if I find a rule number twelve, I'll write that one down too. But rule number eleven is maybe the most important because it culminates everything. Rule number 11, failures are a symptom. A good technician will find the cause of the failure. All failures are a symptom. Now the symptom could be that it's a cheap made part. Maybe yeah. the failure is that your users are abusing the equipment. Maybe the failure is that you don't have a proper PM cycle. I mean, but the thing is, is a failure is always a symptom of a bigger problem. Yeah. And you should always Take the time to try and understand why did it happen in the first place. Because oh. if you understand why it happened, you will always be more successful than the people around you. Man, that's some really good, that's some good meat there. I I like that you use the word failure. And uh, because I think that's, you know, that is an important term to keep in mind. Now... I do have, I would say that sometimes when things have failed, the ship has sailed. <laughs> and it, it, you know, cause sometimes all you can do is say, hey, you know, sorry, you screwed this one up. You need to replace it. You know, I'm not, I don't think you can always come back from a failure. But did but you I, learn from it? 
Exactly. That they and, that's, from it. and if you're teaching that client, you're giving them something way more valuable. Exactly. Because if they're emerging from the interaction with you knowing more than they did, then you know, you you've just given them something that's like that instead of giving them a fish, right? You just taught them how to fish. That's exactly I teach I tell them people that all the time. And in fact, you know, maybe someday I'll write that one down. I have uh, also ten rules uh, <laughs> are, are actually eight rules. The rules of life. And I need to write that one down because I say that to people all the time. Teach a man to fish. And the thing is, is I can solve the problem for you, but what does that really accomplish? Because yeah. yes, it solves your problem and it's the path of least resistance. Yeah. Because that's that's another one is humans are naturally path of least resistance creatures. Yeah. We just want it solved. We don't care how. That's but true. If you are average, then why am I paying you so much? If you're just an average person, and that includes doctors, if you're just an average doctor, why am I going to you? I want to go to the better doctor. Yeah, you, you might, honestly, you might be the only one with uh, appointments in your schedule. Dude, doctors, dentistry is crazy because their schedule, their scheduling is like two or three months out. Yeah. And I, so I even know. with this, how many there are, there are. So, so you know, everyone's gonna, but, you know, I think you're, uh, you know, I like that, man. I think, you know, I'm. we just turned it up to 11. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I got some really good information out of that, Justin. I appreciate that, buddy. It's all good, man. It's all, all, all right. Well, uh, guys, this has uh, been a pleasure being with Justin Barber from the Better Biomed channel. I'll go ahead and link uh, the uh, his, his page. Uh, and also, uh, just know, like, he's actually here in Michigan uh, teaching at a Biomed uh, convention. So for any of you guys that are part of Biomed conventions, you can reach out to, uh, to uh, Justin. He's a very affordable speaker and he will come and he could just drop like truth bombs on your whole group. And if you want to have the level of your organization lifted, and even if you want personal coaching, I mean, you know what? Hey, everyone can be put on a plane and, and hired to come out. And this guy right here is, there's no better consultant over 20 years of experience as a biomed teacher of biomeds justin barber better biomed channel thanks for uh hanging with us at the dental corner repair channel and we'll see you next time all right guys see ya